So when I started architect school, we uh, learned about how cities came to be. Uh, it was a story about urban planning, about prosperity, politics, art, culture, all of that. But the thing we didn't really discuss was all of the other paradigms that happened in parallel that I believe really shaped the cities. And these you all know, it's how steam changed production and transportation, how electricity you know, prolonged our days and brought us underground and above the ground. And this paradigm that my parents grew up in, which uh, was in the 50s and 60s, which shaped our cities. Um, and to one of the earlier points here, I would like to stress that this is a really short period of time. I mean, we've been walking for 10,000 years. We've had cities for thousands of years. And we might look back at cars as something that was really short and temporary technology in our time. The paradigm I grew up in, which is, I, I'm born in the 80s, and by that time, we already had a lot of what we refer to as digital technologies. These are sensors, cell phone networks, real-time data, all of these kind of things. And I think it's interesting to see this kind of technology in uh, relation to things like steam and electricity, because it's going to fundamentally change our cities in the same way as the previous ones. And this is what we uh, tried to work on, but we need also a purpose, what we're going to use this technology for. And, and this is the big number that keeps me inspired every day, is, is that we are going to grow to be 10 billion people on this planet. And these people are going to move into cities, most of them actually, uh, and cities. And that's why I like number 11, because I, I think of cities as a tool and a platform, and, and really humans' greatest invention to actually solve how we can actually be this many people. So even though we are a small Norwegian startup, that's our big goal to look at and explore how actually technology can help us sustain or build a sustainable urban growth. We do multiple concepts, but the one I want to highlight today and, and share some learnings about is, is this little object right here, the bike. It's not really about the bike. I want to show you what the bike is able to do in the city. So this is from Bergen, uh, one of our more recent cities. We launched in Edinburgh in UK last week, but three years ago, um, we knew nothing about bike sharing, really nothing. <laughs> And, and that's to Peter's point, like that's a really good place to be because when you know nothing and you start to realize that you know nothing, the only thing you really can do is go out to talk to people. And things like this usually stand, starts out with the tender document and, and specifications that are in tenders are really just a description of how technology used to look for the last 10 years and is not really depicting how people live their life and how it's changing. So the things you learn from people you talk to is, is more about how Things like this is enabling them to juggle three part-time jobs, uh, people with you know, almost no money, or that's the kind of stories you learn. And that informs your product. So one part of this, obviously there's a lot of designers in the room, so you know this part about talking to, uh, to users. The other part is something I learned from having a few failed startups behind me is, is about timing. So we looked also at you know, what are the technologies that makes things different now that wasn't possible before. And when we started, some of these were that everything is connected. That's a pre-assumption we can start with. Um, cloud services, that we don't have to build a lot of this infrastructure. Um, we are fortunate not to have the back room that Beth showed. You know, we can start having that at Google. Turns out Google are really good at that kind of stuff. Um, also, I think this is an important principle for mobility, is it's to start out with the idea of both real-time data and also machine learning as a principle for how you actually um, make performance in what you do. And the last thing, which has been going for the last 10 years, is also the pre-assumption that everybody has some sort of personal device. Like, I don't want to call it phone anymore, but there's people have access to something, and that's the point. So um, what we did in also was really to focus on that and, and let people unlock bikes with phones. Um, if you look at this industry, and we tested every single app, there were so many features in there. I mean, there were guided tours and whatnot, and there were pin codes and all that. We wanted to um, try and make this a one-button experience, single-click access to, to a service, because everything that gets in the way, even if it's features that people love, like, I don't want to make Tinder for bike sharing. Like, I mean, let people have access to the core product. So we, we built the ability to hit unlock, uh, and there you go, that's your bike. And that, that, was, that was a simple, simple, simple design goal of removing obstacles that are in the way of using a bike. But what's more important is, is the stuff you build on the back, which people don't see, and one of the principles we base ourselves on in geofencing. So we geofence uh, where bikes are available, and we also geofence the users. And then we track where they move, and when they overlap, we make, make it available. 
Obviously, this is not data we store on the personal movement, but we actually track a lot of the transaction in order to understand how the city moves, both the people and the, and the assets. And that's the data I want to focus on today, is, is what we learn from getting data on usage. So again, we didn't know anything, so a lot of this stuff we saw in the first year was news to us. So we started looking at, you know, how long are the trips? This is the typical trips we serve in the city. You know, two and a half kilometers. That's our job in the city, less than 10 minutes. But then we also started to be interested in, in geography, like where are people moving? And we found in the first year, this was the most popular trip. People moving from up there, down there, 450 meter. Didn't really understand, like, why are people biking this distance? Um, turns out, you know, that's a big public transportation hub. This is a big office hub. And people who travel this distance are always in a hurry. They're late for a meeting or they're late for the train. And what they tell us is that because they can save those or shave off those 30 seconds with a bike, that makes public transportation viable for them because they're able to make the train. And that's a really important point is that it's not about the bike, it's not about the train, but it's how you validate a full chain uh, of making public transport a good option. The other thing we see is areas like this. So this is Sörenga in Oslo, a new part of town, super dense, so there's really no room for public transportation out here. And if you want to move all the way from out here and into downtown, it's, it's a good 50 minute walk. So that's the other kind of pattern we see for a lot of trips is that the holes and gaps in the transportation system is filled in with things like a bike. Um, so this, if you go to live, now you can see how, how it's used. Um, and people are biking all over the place, and this is not a random usage. I mean, we can't control where the users are going, but we can actually control, in some sense, where the bikes are. And I'll give and show you how. It's this. <laughs> all of you went like, ah, ah, that's why. So, but this, I just want to tell you like somewhat, so people hear machine learning all the time, but just to give you an idea of, of how we work with it is that we, uh, we predict what we call optimal state. So optimal state is where the bike should be at any given point, at any given day, in order to produce the maximum amount of trips. So we use things like weather, uh, we use our previous historical data from the day before and from the year last year. We'd love to use the router data down the road. Um, it's just in order to understand where should they be so we can algorithmically uh, base our, our offering or where the bikes are. Um, this, is, this approach is what gives you know, the big numbers. So in Oslo, this increased the ridership like crazy amount up to uh, more than two and a half million trips last year. Uh, but that's, that's not really the sustainability numbers that we are looking at. What's interesting to look at is how many trips per bike is produced, because the bike take a footprint, and in order for it to deserve its space in the city, it should produce a lot of trips. And the other thing is also, like, I mean, you could achieve these numbers with like marketing tricks uh, and just pumping in a lot of uh, users. So the other sustainability number we're looking at is, are we able to increase the number of trips per users? Because that's when you build sustainable change in behavior. So these are really the numbers that matters. And also, it lets us look at fleet utilization. So the green area here is when the bikes are less used. That's typically now, when we're at work. Uh, that's uh, the that's, uh, trips that are usually covered by these guys. We are doing one third of the taxis in Oslo right now. I want to do more. Uh, so we're piloting right now an option where every receptionist or HR person or whatever in the, in the company can issue uh, bike rides to everybody instead. And what we learned actually talking to Rutte is it makes it a lot easier for the companies if we don't make them pay for it to issue the code. So now they only pay for it if the, it actually results in the bike trips. We place that after the actual value is created. Um, but this year, we started to look sort of what we call behind the numbers. Like, because you start out looking at the most obvious numbers, like where are people going? What are the big numbers? What are the, what are the ones, stuff we want to brag about, right? Um, and this year, we, we started looking at what are we missing? What is the stuff we don't see in the obvious numbers? So we looked at things like age. So on the left here, this is where our uh, senior users uh, are living. And on the right, this is where our, our students are living. You can see Björnsen Studentium, you can see Sankt Seven Bischlet, and you see that the city is really divided. Like, it's completely different. If you just look at your users, the city looks like the same. 
Um, and that's also reflected in, in where, the, where they write. So my age, we would be writing down here, but you see the students up here, obviously. So this is you know, an easier way to look at it, but when, when it gets more interesting is to when we started to look at gender, because we were curious, like, are there gender biases built into what we do? Because we know that we have more men riding bikes than women, and we want to understand why, and actually what we can look, uh, learn from looking at gender as perspective. Um, we are working with uh, TOEI, the Norwegian uh, Research Institute for Transportation, that helps us actually on some of the methods, but we provide a lot of the data. So this is an article that comes out later this fall, but I just want to show you one of the results wh which we're looking at, which is the dark shapes <coughs> in Oslo here is where you will find um, workplaces that are dominated by women. You know, we have hospitals, nursing homes, that kind of things. Um, and then down center, you have more financial institution, typically more dominated by men. Um, that part we are not going to be able to fix. Uh, but <laughs> what we see in our data is that actually, if you see, look at the thicker lines, these are the routes that are uh, women dominated, where we have more female ridership that correlates where, where they're working. And then what happens when you then overlay uh, the transportation map and look at where transportation is, you realize that we built the transportation for men in Oslo to get men from where they live and down to downtown. Sorry, it's just how it is. <laughs> um, so, but my point is, you know, we, when we start out producing as many trips as possible, we are basically just reinforcing that bias that we are bringing men downtown. So, you know, the other thing that you could do is basically say, let's, let's build another KPI. Let's fix the transportation to the system. Let's look at the holes that we're missing and use this dynamic component that is not based on tracks or whatever to fix these kind of things, to identify this. And this, this whole thing got me back to uh, Lefebvre, which was mentioned earlier today, which is, uh, again, back from when I studied, you know, this is one of our big heroes, discussing, you know, what is actually the right to the city. And I think, I think this becomes more and more and more important that we, when things become algorithmically or, or machine learning based, that we remember the importance of our, the human moral imagination to actually think about what we're achieving. To give you another example, I was, I was just in Stockholm discussing the idea of filter bubbles, but not filter bubbles in the in traditional sense. You're all familiar with this concept, right? Like the intellectual isolation of your own ideas that get reinforced to the extreme and we end up here. <laughs> so, <laughs> or, or the other way, but this is starting to happen in our physical world because when you enter lunch into Google Maps, you know, we start to get different results. So we're driving the same, you know, um, white middle class kids to the same avocado toast down the same routes in the city. And we start to segregate the city based on preferences and behavior in class. And that's gonna shape our cities. So then, you know, we have this physical filter bubble idea. And if we bring that back to the industry I'm currently in, uh, you know, we can start to have an, a discussion about access. Because if the algorithms in the, some of these services are based on who is willing to pay for this trip. You know, you actually might have these assets, vehicles, whatever, start actually automatically moving to where the money is, right? So, and this becomes invisible to us. We're not regulating this. It's not, it's not obvious in the same way. So that's why I'm, I'm still, you know, think the idea of open data is more important than everyone, uh, you know, never, because I think we will start to see more and more things like, you know, bias audits and that kind of things that you actually have to, to answer to who are you serving and based on what principles. So, let's talk about something completely different. Um, we uh, have bikes out in, in, in the city and as a lot of you know, having public infrastructure makes that, you know, they will be vandalized, they're used a lot. So we actually get help from our users to have reports coming back in if there's something wrong with the bikes. So uh, when there's something wrong, uh, people will hit this button, says report, and they will select what's wrong, and we get the report and all that. Um, we started out having numbers on the bike in the first year. Turns out numbers are really hard to remember. So last year, we renamed all of the bikes after uh, people who live in Oslo. So we worked with uh, st the Statistical Bureau to get the 3,000 most popular names in Oslo. So that's those names are on the bike now, um, which you know the users are really happy when they find themselves. But also, 
it gives you an idea of who lives here. Like, and also we have a large uh, Polish population, we have a large North African population, and it's really interesting to see how actually the bikes, you know, then are crossing borders that the people are not in the city, and makes people actually reflect over that. But the point is, when one of the bikes are reported faulty, we lock it down if it's a uh, safety issue, and we push that into uh, an Android app, so you can see where the bikes are. We started out using these uh, trucks you can see down here. Um, so we tracked them live. This is, these are the trucks that would pick the bikes up and bring them back to the workshop. Turns out we lose a lot of important time on the street if you're bringing them on trucks. And also you don't want the trucks driving that much around the city. So what we changed last year is to swap out the trucks and the workshop with putting the workshop on to bikes. So now we bring the workshop out to the bikes. It's more efficient uh, and the bike stays on the street. And also, we start looking into, you know, who should be doing this job. So that's why you can see the Red Cross logo on his arm, because the people working on the street on this mobile workshop, they get their mechanical training while they're still in prison. And then once they get out, they get an Android phone uh, and this cargo bike, and they get their first job, fixing bikes on the street. And it's a purpose that they're out there meeting people, because, you know, they get the feedback uh, that actually build them back up as a citizens. Another area where we started looking at who can do this job is a concept we call never full, because you know, the bike get, you know, city gets congested. Uh, so we manned some stations to handle a lot of the bikes. We started out with students, because we figured you know, they need part-time job, they can do it before lecture. Uh, turns out after their finals, they leave the city, so it's not really a stable <laughs> workforce. Um, so we started looking for someone else, and uh, then we found this amazing new temp agency, uh, which is, based really on people who are either retired or at the end of their career, uh, but they don't have a job, but they still want to work. Um, so now we actually man these stations with senior citizens. And the best thing is, you know, old people, I, I kind of knew this, but they're so good at getting up in the morning, and they're also <laughs> super happy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you should meet, I think it's at Speak Yusufba. There's this amazing old lady in leopard, like, uh, pants in the morning. I love her. <laughs> so um, we've had, you know, all these thousand bikes out for for a few years now, and you try to shape a behavior, but at some point, you know, it kind of flips around, and and it's really what you put out in the world who's shaping how you think about it. And if you look outside of Europe where we operate, that's completely different. Oh, there's was it supposed to be this creepy sound? But um, <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> um, but the, what we try to solve is um, is really how we balance this flexibility and order and performance. Because a lot of things you do in the city is really about that balance. It made it sound like I had a bigger purpose for this. <laughs> but we kind of do, because because uh, we built a whole new product based on what we saw. Um, so. Now we, we develop this lock that goes on the front of the bike, and we still can use stations in like more dense part of the city to keep that order. But that's a whole different topic, by the way, but I love the idea of like circular economy. So these uh, bike stations are now made of actual aluminum out of recycled cars. So you actually can turn bike cars into bike infrastructure. Um, but so we want to combine this, but also with the more flexible idea of, of using these assets. So parking, you know, three bikes like this. But to avoid these heaps and, and you know, um, littering bikes that we see in around the world, we now regulate this also by geofences. So we can draw areas in the city and, and determine how many bikes do we allow here. Is it four? Is it 80? It depends on where the city is. And also, it's not static. I mean, some can open up in the morning and close down. It can change with festivals. It can change with you know national holidays. So actually, making also the techn technology dynamic to respond to the city. Uh, oh. So what we really left with is is all these virtual regulations of of how the city works. But the actual behavior is all about you know the vehicle and the user, and you remove pretty much everything else. And this leads me into the three trends I want to close with. Because I think that's that's how we look at mobility right now, um, at least you know what it looks like in the next two years. The first one is that transportation is becoming adaptive. It's kind of to to the CEO in Luther's point that Beth mentioned that uh, we're moving away from an idea of transportation being scheduled 
and come into a place and where actually transportation responds to us. But I think it's still worth noting that um, this is not going to be the, the Uber idea where the, the car comes directly to where you are. That's an individual um, approach that doesn't scale. What we will see more and more of is more group user experience where you uh, want to leave from here uh, at this point, but you're asked to go over here five minutes later because that's better for the group and then does provide a better system. The other thing that's happening right now is um, something, I pulled this slide out of uh, Lyft's strategy deck. A lot of the discussion of the last three years was all about what's on the right side, the autonomous car. To me, the autonomous car discussion is a lot like the early day of personal computing where we used you know, physical stationery and paper to understand how the future will look like. And I think we're failing when we're using the car as a lens to understand the future. Because what's happening in the last eight to 10 months is that it's tr completely transitioned over to the left side uh, and what people call micromobility. We're not really talking about the vehicle in itself, but the idea of something that is cheap, it's rolled out to the market quick. Like autonomous car takes 10 years to develop. A new scooter, you know, it can bring it to market like a cell phone. So they're cheap, they're accessible, and it's way more disruptive in the market than the autonomous car ever will be. The last thing is the idea of multimodality. And I just want to highlight this because I, I take really issue with the idea of uh, mass, the, the idea of transportation as a service. Because it makes sense if you're a big company. So this is what Uber is rolling out. They're rolling out that they own you as a user and provide all the transport for you. And I think this is the difference between how the internet is built, which is built around open standards and collaboration, and that's how cities work. Or you could take the Facebook approach where you say, I want to own everything. And that's what a lot of the mass initiatives are. And I don't think we as a society really want to go there. We want to focus on how people collaborate. So there are a lot of discussions um, in the last few years about what you call smart city. And I'm really happy to see that we are kind of sloping down from that hype. Because what we need to discuss now is not really technology. We have the technology. We need to understand the implications of the technology, and we get need to get down on the street level and understand how we <coughs> want to organize our cities and understand that from a user level. Thank you. Mm -hmm.